Welcome to Blue Rain Gallery Podcast. Uh, today in the studio we have Star Hardridge, amazing painter from Oklahoma um, and many other areas of the United States. <laughs> I mean, we're talking New York and Tennessee and Oklahoma. And Kentucky. Kentucky. Parts unknown. Yeah, Santa Fe in the end, right? That's, that's pretty cool. Well, welcome, Star. And uh, boy, uh, I've enjoyed talking to you this afternoon and hopefully we can keep this going. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Some good stories. Um, let's start like we do with everybody else. Uh, for this year, we're just trying to give people an overview of who our artists are and where they came from and their journey. So uh, let's start there. Where were you born? Uh, give us a description of your childhood. Um, also, the beginning of your journey in art. I was born in uh, Denison, Texas. And... Um, I have a twin brother named Cody Hardridge, and uh, so right there, I was, it, was, it was interesting right off the bat, and uh, I was raised uh, throughout Oklahoma. My father was a, uh, it was a ranch hand to begin with in uh, lower southeast Oklahoma, in Duran, Oklahoma. He worked for my, my grandfather at the time, and uh, um, he you know, was in charge of uh, the ranch. And, and uh, later became a, um, a oil field uh, roughnecker, you know. So we were always on the road, you know, kind of going up and down I-35 in Oklahoma, and uh, lived in uh, southwestern Oklahoma and places like Chickasha and Anadarko, uh, Enid, uh, and then eventually Blackwell, and uh, we kind of settled there for a while. Um, always always been involved in arts since I was a child. A lot of our other artists that we've interviewed, a lot of them start off like doodling or writing yeah. or drawing. Was that how you were raised? Uh, I mean, did you do that as a kid? Yes. Like yeah. I was always into, uh, you know, drawing. Um, I remember uh, <clears throat> winning, uh, I think my first success was a, a, a street chalk drawing contest, you know, when I was probably eight or nine years old. Oh, nice. And uh, I remember winning that, and I drew a clown, and, and, and it got featured in the, in the Blackwell newspaper. And, uh, and that was, you know, it encouraged me to keep moving forward. And uh, I guess when I was probably in the fifth grade, 10 years old, uh, we took drawing classes, you know, uh, through some, a little bit of a video art instruction on the TV. And I, I, I kind of got an idea then that, my work looked different from everybody else. You know, I, I could render things. So, uh, you know, just by people telling you, oh, you're good at something, you know, this is, this is, this is good for you. And having that, that praise, you know, it encouraged me to move, move forward. What about your um, education? And when I say education, I always talk like, well, well what degree you got? But it's not about the degree, but what was your journey as far as education oh. in, in that, in art itself? And how did you get from where you started to where you're at now. Uh, my, my parents had a fabulous 1970s album collection. And I think seeing the album art. Uh, oh, yeah, back the then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everything was illustrated, you know, and it was a, it was a big deal. You know, and nothing was really done digitally and uh, no computers. You had to ha hire actual artists, yeah. you know, to, to lay out, you know, the album covers and things like that. So I, rem I remember, you know all the bright colors and renderings and things like that. And I was like, wow, this is, this is something that's really interesting. Um, another great influence is that my, uh, my, my father and his family and my mother's side of the family were both collectors of original art and specifically native art, um, both from um, Oklahoma in the, the, the mid-century and uh, Southwestern art, you know, from Santa Fe to, to, to Phoenix, you know, and I, I got to see these things firsthand um, from Kachina dolls to watercolors to oil paints to bronzes. And uh, this was a major, major impact on me uh, as a child. I was fascinated with them, and I even tried to, you know, draw them and copy them. And that was before um, instruction in, uh, in art school. Uh, this was my major influence. I later went on to attend uh, Savannah College of Art and Design, which I graduated. Uh, and uh, that kind of blew my, my world apart. Um, first of all, it was an art school by the beach. And being an Oklahoma nice. kid, I'd never <laughs> seen the ocean before, before I went to Savannah, Georgia. And uh, seeing the palm trees, the Spanish moss, 
the ambience of the town. It really was fertile ground for, for growth and seeing all these people from all over the world. They had a lot of international students. So it really turned me on to a lot of different mindsets. Yeah. That is cool, and, and, and especially you're landlocked in Oklahoma, and then all of a sudden you're on the beach. <laughs> that yeah. is pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I mean, looking out in uh, Blackwell, Oklahoma, you have just plains of, of, of wheat, alfalfa, and well, endless horizons. Yeah, so I was interviewing uh, Catherine Stedham a couple weeks ago, and uh, she she grew up uh, raised in the East Coast mm -hmm. with all the trees, and you've lived out there. So I did I did that in reverse. Yes, actually. you did it in reverse, mm -hmm. and so like the East Coast. I mean, trying to get a horizontal line is hard with all those trees. Exactly, unless you're on the ocean. It's all atmospheric perspective. I yes, think. yeah, a yeah. lot of humidity. Um, a lot of trees, and, and uh, you really have to capture uh, the quality of light, which may be diffused yeah. um, at times uh, through the weather. Yeah, yeah. That, that's pretty cool. So um, your journey into your, your realization of your nativeness, I guess. How would we describe that? Wow. Um, I think that it was... Your uh, heritage, I should say. The heritage was always there. Uh, I come from a biracial family. Uh, my father is uh, Creek and Shawnee and Irish, and my mother is German and Irish uh, heritage uh, that I know of. And, uh, you know, uh, I grew up in, in Oklahoma, and I was, I was exposed to, to Native culture, but I lived outside of the bounds of the Creek Nation. So that uh, traditional... Creek knowledge and tradition was out of my reach at the time. And I was exposed more to the, the art and culture of the Southern Plains, um, which would go on later to influence uh, the art that I have now. Both have equal amounts because I try to, to respect both. Um, but um, that was kind of like a foundation. And I always tried to reach out further because of my experiences in art college and then later on, traveling uh, to, to Europe to expand my, uh, my, my, uh, my knowledge in uh, decorative arts. So, so Star Hardridge is a person that is of native heritage, uh, but his process is very unique. Uh, and it's probably from, would you say, some of those travels you've had and the education experience? Absolutely. I believe that I had to experience all genres of art in the modern sense, in the classical sense, to arrive to where I am today, um, you almost have to learn, you know, uh, a certain kind of language before you're able to, you know, you know word always, by word, and before yeah. you can speak it and make it sing. I always, uh, when I when I study artists and their their journey, um, we all have people that we appreciate and we imitate till we find our own voice. And uh, who, who are some of the people that influenced you of, of the mid-century artists to get you in this direction? Uh, definitely Woody Crumbo, I would say. Um, Woody Bigbo, Larry Hood, um, Alan Hauser. Um, but also the modern artists that I would come to know later in life. Um, Picasso. Mm -hmm. uh, Salvador Dali, uh, a, a lot of modern artists like Frank Stella. Um. So um, you, you lived in France for a while. Yes, I did. Uh, what type of influence did that have on your career? Uh, I, well, it just I mean, expanded my horizons altogether. Like I said, I was, I was raised primarily in Oklahoma and southeastern United States. Um, then uh, traveling to uh, northeast and being a decorative painter, we got to a point, uh, me and my, my ex-wife and, and now business partner, uh, she's been my business partner for 20 years um, or more, and we decided that we were kind of missing the boat, that uh, what we were doing as far as decorators was becoming trendy and that we wanted to get back to the root of, of where these, this craft was made. And it was primarily you know European, um, it, Decorators, the, uh, we could go back there. There were certain instructors that we'd go back and study with, and we studied with the best craftsman of France, uh, named Michel Nadai, and he became my mentor and uh, really opened up my, my ideas about uh, materials and techniques 
and broaden uh, my my whole palette of, of, of skills. So you're 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 more than just an artist. What what other things did you do in in the last few years that helped in this process? What what other things were you doing? Uh, well, we were uh, in early on in my decorative painting career. We were doing a lot of residential and commercial uh, design and decorative painting, and that that the scope is is from like wall glazing um, to marbleization, faux wood, uh, panoramic design, mural design, different types of uh, wall plasters, decorative uh, Venetian plasters, uh, more traditional Italian marmorinos. We were always working and developing new techniques and working with new materials. So it really broaden the scope. I wasn't locked into acrylic or oil or gouache or watercolor. We were working with really modern materials, uh, new acrylic polymers that could give us different effects, different lighting effects, some, some metallics and things that kind of like phased out with the 90s. Um, but it really, I, I didn't feel like I was in a box with what I was doing. And I was really, I mean, as all artists, are, you know, they're continually searching for their own individual voice. And I had not found it at that point. So I was definitely on the journey trying to figure out what it is that I wanted to do, you know. Um, deep inside, it had nothing to do with my decorative painting career. That was, you know, a craft. You know, I didn't it, look it, at it as a fine art. It seems like it may have and it may not have. But I will, I will say this to the audience. Um, Blue Rain Gallery represents artists that are pioneers in different arenas and it doesn't mean replicating something that somebody else has done it, it means finding your voice like you just described but it sometimes takes a journey to get there but star hardridge uh, you have created a very unique identity and voice something that hasn't e existed in the native genre or in general uh, because of your travels your experience your experiments uh, learning all of these processes. So, and, and, and that's just a pretext to, to what I, I really want to talk about. So, I, I brought this little painting that Star just brought in. Yes. It's beautiful. Describe your process. This, this is a can, uh, a strict uh, plaster on canvas, which is your base, your regular, regular prime canvas. And uh, it has a layer of... of is it gesso? Uh, it's, it's gessoed canvas. So then over the top, I will lay out, at the time when I was coming up with this, I, I used cheesecloth um, as a means to develop a texture. And I was really trying to develop a texture that mimicked um, the, uh, the uh, I guess, the, the grid or the radiance that you see in sort of like a stretched hide. Mm -hmm. There's a matrix, even in our own skin, that exists. And that's something that I was trying to emulate on, on the canvas. And what I would do is I would lay it down a material like cheesecloth and later on a nylon mesh. And I would screed a uh, layer of black Venetian plaster over the top, peel up that material, and it would leave an impression of a grid. And what I was looking for as far as the grid was uh, something to guide me in my in my practice much like uh, a bead worker would use gridded paper to yes. organize their designs i would screed another layer of venetian plaster to make it smooth but you could still see the grid at the surface you know and this was sort of a, a, a boundary to organize um what would yet to become like a, just thousands of dots you know it had to organize the space somehow so it was all determined about the grid. And then I would, I would put a, 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 just a, a light watercolor pencil drawing over the top um, for my illustration outlining the, the initial design and then start color blocking from then on out. And uh, to keep the, the color pure um, was really important to me at the time. Later, I would start to overlap color, uh, let color dissolve out of a sort of a, a squeeze bottle needle that I use as an applicator to put the paint down. So I would get some sort of color graduation. Um, but you don't see that in a lot of beadwork. It's just 
pure color, color blocking, hard edged. And, you know, that is what I was really attracted to. Um, but I would also be attracted to um, the, uh, the crazy organic shapes of the southeastern pre-removal period of, of beadwork, which is completely different from Southern Plains beadwork. And it's not that I was trying to copy their beadwork. I wanted to use it as a springboard, as a jumping off point to create a different dialogue for my paintings. So basically what, what Starr is saying in, in some respects is this is a, a pointillistic method that's similar to beadwork in a way. In a trompe sense, I was trying to recreate beadwork aesthetic. But as far as making a painting goes, I did not want to be... I wanted to separate myself, divorce myself from traditional um, predispositions of... like You, you have parameters of, of what painting should be. You have to use a brush. You have to use shadow and light. It has to go this way. And this is all determined through European styles of painting that have been developed over the years. And, and they've been put on to, to, uh, to, to me and other painters. Most painters. As, like, these, are, these are the boundaries of what you can do. And I, I was like, no, this is, you can do more. Because I've experimented. I know it's possible. I can create a different way to go about telling my stories. And it doesn't have to include a brush. It can be my own path. And it can give a nod to the past of these art forms um, that I really respect and that I love. I'm not a bead worker, but somehow whatever it was that I was painting, and I hope this is not taken the wrong way, I was sort of putting my own stamp on it, you know, mm -hmm. as an indigenous person that I could sort of indigenize whatever I was doing if I sort of laid it out as, you know, as if it was beaded, but it's not beaded because it's paint. So Star has just described what innovation is, and uh, that's hard to find. A lot of people can imitate, but to create something different in a new way is amazing and beautiful. And that speaks in, in um, a very high manner of what you've done and what you've created, Star. You've, you're... You're an innovator. You're no different than some of the people you just talked about, like Woody Crumble or Alan Hauser, in particular, where they created genres of a new medium and a new way to, to do things or see things through. And uh, we were talking at lunch today about that exact same thing. In, in Santa Fe, we have 350 galleries, and um, there's a lot of artists that paint like other artists. But you can go to every gallery in this town and you will not find anything like this. It's unique, it's innovative, and it's because of your journey and the learned journey. You, you paid a lot of time into experimenting with textures and techniques. Uh, you could probably paint a flat painting, would be my guess. Absolutely. Right? Pretty easy. Absolutely. But not, not in this format. It's a, it's a lot uh, more difficult. Now, let's, let's move on to talk about your journey into your awakening of your heritage. Okay. When <clears throat> did you start realizing your heritage, your, your native heritage, in a sense? I mean, because we're all boiling pots. We, we were talking about sure. my heritage and my daughter's, uh, you know, we're a mixture mm -hmm. of native, we're mm -hmm. a mixture of yes. uh, German, Irish, whatever. Um, but when did you start really getting focused on your uh, native heritage? Absolutely. I'm, I am a mutt. I'm an American. Uh, my heritage is German, Irish, Shawnee, and Muscogee Creek. Um, I grew up in in a small little town in uh, northern Oklahoma uh, during the mid '80s, uh, not on the res, and not necessarily around my own tribe. You know, um, I was aware uh, that uh, I had native heritage, but it. it, it you know, I wasn't living in, in that situation, you know. It was, I just considered myself an American. Um, through my years of studying art and going away from my family, going away from Oklahoma, visiting New York, Connecticut, other places around the country, and then traveling extensively through Europe, 
I, I, I've always considered myself looking for something, looking for that self, looking through a certain identity, you know, and trying to develop myself as an artist, learning every genre that I could, ultimately left me back to my home state, which was Oklahoma. And uh, I came back in, I think, 2007 after visiting Europe and going fishing with uh, my brothers and my, my father and going to a local powwow, something I think was really truly awakened in me, saying that uh, possibly, you know, you have a voice in, in, uh, in, in native art and expressing yourself in your own way. And by me connecting with my own family, connecting with other natives, connecting with more traditional people in, in my own tribe, um, art has been a bridge for me to not only learn about my traditional culture, but my, myself. I've been uh, reconnected with people in my own family that I've been estranged from, and it sort of unlocked some, some mysteries um, that, I, that I'd wonder about all my life. And through that, all those things have, have, have formed a, 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 a blanket, a, a, something that I've been able to you know, wrap myself around and, and has become a part of my own identity. And all of that um, came to fruition um, something you know, after actually the death of my father. And I used a new way of working to kind of work through those emotional times. And I stopped showing it markets, stopped showing it Indian markets. You know, I haven't showed it in Indian markets since 2014. And I knew that I wanted to change everything in my life, you know. And I was involved in a show that they wanted to demonstrate resilience, um, the, the removal act of, of the southeastern Indians. And um, I just wanted to find, you know, find out, you know, more about the mystery. And I wanted to illustrate what was, what was gained, what was lost. And so I thought about beadwork. And I think during the 1700s that, you know, the Creek bead workers, you know, it was, they were prolific. And some of that died out after they were removed to Oklahoma. Some of those art forms were lost, you know, along the way. You know, that, that, that reminds me of a tie, uh, in a sense, to Christopher Penn, because we, we were talking uh, a few weeks ago about... Um, as westward expansion happened, and uh, obviously the, the sadness of forcing the native people, peoples into reservations, um, but they they were recorders. They the before the, the before the paper it was buffalo skins, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in in your case, uh, your heritage probably recorded things through bead beadwork. Well, I, I, the beadwork was an amalgam of. Um, different technologies. If you look at craft as technology, um, looking way back into Mississippian times, built, mound builder times, um, it was all really focused on uh, the technology of, of pottery, yeah. you know, the, and, and shell carving. Mm -hmm. Those were the earliest representations of, of our art forms, and they're still recorded today um, through, through uh, different collections. But the, the, the shell carvings and the pottery, the, all, all the forms and, and patterns you see, they graduated through time and they were represented through basket weaving and then later through beadwork. Mm -hmm. And these, these are traditions that, that, you know, that have been handed down and evolved as their technologies and what, what they had available to work with uh, through, uh, through colonial trade. Um, that's, that's, that's how, how it evolved over time. And now I just see what I'm doing is a next step in the evolution of, of that dialogue, um, dating all the way back from you know, 1100 AD you know, to 2021. And I wanted to take paint out of the context of, 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 of the, the brush applicated acrylic you know, surface. You know? It didn't necessarily have to be paint, you know. Um, it had. It was taking on a new persona, you know. Through my experiences of trompe l'oeil in, in France and representing um, paint as a physical material such as marble or wood, mm -hmm. I was like, why can't I do do that uh, with beadwork, you know, and use paint, you know? So I started, you know, dabbing paint, and I 
over the course of the year, I perfected my tech, my own technology, my own way of working. And this had nothing to do with my years at SCAD. This had nothing to do with my years traveling Europe, going to the Louvre, going to the Familia Sagrada, going to, you know, the Vatican. It had nothing to do with that. This was something that was really personal. And it was, it was it, it, you know, something that I knew that was, it was bigger than myself. So, and I, I found my own path and voice through it, you know. Star, it's one thing that you've um, developed a, a, a new form of, of how to paint in a way. Because uh, I've, I've never seen a, a pointillistic method that looks like beads like you've done uh, via paint. And that's, that's very unique. Um, the other part, though, is your awakening of your culture and things that are within your heart that you're noticing. And uh, one of my favorite paintings that you've done is actually right behind you. And um, describe that a little bit. Uh, the scene, is it your nephew hunting? Oh, uh, Young Buck. Yes. Young Buck. Um, yeah, it, you know, it, it, it is sort of a classical hunting scene. And it is the, the son of my twin brother, uh, Caden Hardridge, who is a deer hunter. Um, they, they do hunt with bows, uh, and, as well as black powder and, and other rifles. Um, it's something they, they do every November. And uh, I just wanted to capture his youth, but it wasn't really about hunting at all. It was about this young man who was 17 years old, embarking on a new part of his life and going after life, you know, unprepared, but having more gumption than, than uh, experience, you know, and that, that is the essence of, of young buck, you know, where he, he's not, he's not pointing the arrow at the deer. He's not prepared, but he's ready to do it. He's ready to do it. He's probably going to miss those deer, but he's out there. He's, he's willing and he's trying, you know, and he's, he's got a little bit of a uh, traditional regalia on, uh, you know, there's a little, a little bit of a, a beaded, uh, breech cloth and, uh, uh, leggings that you see sometimes in uh, traditional Seminole people, they'll, they'll wear those uh, sort of uh, serrated uh, leather leggings that they, they say they're supposed to detour like snakes and high grass. Um, Especially out in the, they, the they southeast, would, right? Yeah, they have those they timber would, rattlers. They would, they're supposed to like strike the, the uh, tendrils of the, uh, of the leggings rather than the legs itself. So that's kind of like the belief behind it. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, you know, I see this young man, you know, on the cusp of becoming a man, but still a boy. And uh, it, it, his adventures are just beginning. Mm, nice. I love that. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think we should talk about um, what's going on right now and what you want to accomplish in your future. I was... A public uh, project? I was selected by... There was a selection committee... Uh, for the first American art museum in Oklahoma City. Um, it's been, uh, been in pr production and planning for the last 20 years, and it's finally, hopefully being wrapped up uh, this next year, slated to open in, uh, by the uh, fall solstice uh, of 2021. And uh, this is a really definitive, you know, Native American museum that's you know, just collections, but it's, it's it's over oversighted by you know an all Native American board you know their curators and uh, you know through multiple donations and grants and it's been a long time coming trying to get this thing together but it's coming together and uh, I guess their selection committee decided to nominate me. Um, as the fabricating artist for Jerry Redcorn's uh, installation for the Origins Theater there. And uh, Jerry Redcorn is a traditional Caddoan potter from Oklahoma, and she is noted for reviving um, ancient Caddo style uh, traditional pottery you know, in the uh, mid to early 90s. And she's being honored through this. And I'm being honored as well, uh, being selected to manifest the aesthetics of her pottery onto a 14 foot by 66 foot in diameter, thousand square foot wall, 
which is the exterior of the Origins Theater. And this will all be rendered through um, Venetian plaster, stencils of her pottery designs that are buried in uh, subsequent layers of plaster and waxed and burnished to have like a two-tone uh, aesthetic of pottery, you know, to emulate her work. And it's, it's uh, in, uh, in collaboration with the Oklahoma Arts Council, so it's a state-funded project. And uh, it's, look, in 2012, I was responsible for recreating 11 murals in the United States Capitol building. Uh, I had to reproduce the work of Constantine Bermidi, hmm. who was the original designer and fresco painter in the United States Capitol building. To me, this is more important to create this monument to the people that originally inhabited the state of Oklahoma, which were the Wichita people and the Caddo people, but also putting my thumbprint on Oklahoma City because my father, my grandparents on both sides are buried in Oklahoma City. My twin brother, my younger brother, my aunts, my mother, everybody lives in Oklahoma City. That, that is, that's the place where I call home. What's homeland? Yeah, so this is something that I, I think that my, my, my own children will be able to go there, learn about other cultures. There's 39 affiliated tribes you know, that are uh, in, Oklahoma. in Oklahoma, you know, it has the highest density of native population, you know, outside of California, New Mexico, New York. Uh, so I got a lot of roots there, you know, yeah. and uh, it's a big deal. And also it symbolizes um, sort of a healing, you know, of, of a lot of, lot of different broken relationships. And one of the most important relationships was a relationship with my ex-wife because you know, not only is she the, the mother of my children, but she's also, I've made her the partner on this job. You know, we, we worked together in the dec decorative painting facet for over 20 years and uh, being able to come back together again and create this sort of opus of work, which I believe it is. I don't, I've never seen this kind of project, you know, take place. I'm really excited about it, um, but I knew I couldn't do it alone. You yeah. can't do it alone. Sometimes you got to reach out for help and to the person talk that about, you would least expect. Talk about full circles, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and by going back there and, you know, having a little bit of humility and saying, you know, I need that help, you can, you can, you can create something that is bigger than yourself, bigger than your own uh, personality, bigger than your own ego. And it, it's going to affect people for, for, I think, years to come. Yeah. That's a, that's a wonderful compliment to who you are, uh, Star, and, and congratulations on that. And Thank you. We're looking forward to all the imagery we can get from that um, as they permit, because I know it's their project, but yeah. we, we want to support that and, uh, and recognize that uh, as far as your career and also for the people of Oklahoma. That's, that's amazing, a uh, beautiful thing. Um, as far as going forward as an artist, where do you see yourself in 10, 15 years? I've been fortunate to go from obscurity to, you know, the lowly, you know, like hum humility of native art market scenes. And uh, I'm a veteran of SWIA, uh, of uh, regional art shows in Oklahoma, um, which I've proudly, you know, represented my tribe and myself um, to, uh, to installations in public places, to now museums. Uh, a lot of my own and a lot through Blue Rain, which I am very grateful for. Um, I think there's five different museums across the nation that uh, now have my work in their collections. Um, and that will grow. I, I, yeah, I, I want to continue, but uh, also, you know, I, I did not wear, uh, you know, I wear uh, glasses, you know, um, five, six years ago. Um, my eyes, yeah, it, it, this doing this style of work, it is diminishing my eyesight. I will admit that. So I feel that maybe things may be moving towards a more sculptural type of uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have uh, collaborated um, with an, another uh, ceramicist. And I'm thinking that maybe uh, ceramics 
maybe a, a possibility three-dimensional objects, uh, maybe a possibility to be a, a, a vehicle for um, my technique in the future. And uh, I'm excited to see where that's going to lead. Uh, I have done a couple of things, and, and one of them is a collaboration with uh, Chase Earls, who is a Caddo potter, uh, again from uh, the Caddo and uh, Mississippian culture uh, we've collaborated with. And uh, have ended up in a, a great exhibit uh, that is the most definitive uh, collection of Spiro objects, which Spiro is a, a mounted complex in uh, southeastern Oklahoma, which was the apex of uh, Mississippian culture, Catawan culture in uh, between Mount, 1100 and 1300 uh, AD. Mound culture. Yes. Yeah. Um, that that's wonderful, Star. And uh, we're we're really excited about your future and um ceramics that's a wonderful thing but it's it's a whole, another experience another level uh, but it, it wouldn't surprise me because of the journey you've the journey you have had in your art career and the experimental processes that you've undertaken uh, to to get to this point so it'll be interesting to see where you take this in the future uh, hang in there and stick with it. Like, you, you don't, we don't find artists like you, you, you know, uh, that are innovative and different or that have spent time to experiment with different things to get to where they are now. Um, I'd like to thank Star for coming in today. Uh, loved interviewing you. Uh, I'd like to encourage all of uh, our audience to subscribe to our podcast on Apple uh, Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube. But we'll mostly post this through uh, Facebook. And uh, you can also get it through our um, website, blueraingallery.com, under uh, podcasts. And um, thank you again, Star. And we'll look forward to your future. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you.